I do appreciate it. Uh, I have been through a battle with some cancer problems, and I, my voice is probably not as strong as it normally is, but I'll try to keep it to where you can hear everything I say. I told someone yesterday over at Westside Baptist Church for their 50th anniversary, one lesson I learned during this ordeal is this. I get up each morning and dust off my wit. I pick up my paper and read the obit. <laughs> if my name's not in it, I know I'm not dead. So I eat a good breakfast and go back to bed. <laughs> That's not bad. <laughs> doing well, and I'm grateful to God for your prayers. Those of you who have prayed for me and for Nancy in these past days. Now this is an interesting assignment, leaving a legacy for your grandchildren in prayer, or simply leaving a legacy for your grandchildren that involve prayer. How they choose to go at it, leaving a legacy is vitally important. Now, let me introduce you first to my grandchildren, so you'll know who I'm talking about. Now, Nancy and I waited until we were 18 years old to get married. So in June, we'll be married 59 years. And so our grandchildren are probably older than some of your grandchildren. But we have five. Our oldest granddaughter is named Ashley. Now, Ashley is the sensitive soul of the bunch. She can cry at a wounded possum on the highway. <laughs> I mean, she's just a sensitive soul. She's in training to become a registered nurse. She loves working with people and dealing with people. Our Chelsea, who is the next oldest, who is our son's daughter, is graduating from medical school in May and getting ready to start the trek toward her residency and hopefully a fellowship in orthopedic surgery. She's a bright young lady in many ways. I can't explain how bright she is at times. It makes me feel like Ned in the second reader sometimes in talking to her. She's a wonderful young lady, as is Ashley. Our third grandchild is named Alex. And Alex is married and has our only great grandchild whom we have never seen. She's five months old. They live in Anchorage, Alaska. He's in the Army. Now, there's a lot of things I do, but going to Anchorage, Alaska in December is not one of them. <laughs> so they're coming home soon, and we'll get to see them. I have a grandson whose name is John. I told my son whose name is John. Now, you don't have to name your son John, but I don't have to keep you in the will. <laughs> so we thought John was about as good as he could do. And John is, uh, John Brock is involved in agricultural management as a senior at LSU. So all of our kids are in school. All of them are doing well. We have one other. Her name is Sammy. She's 12. All of the others are in their 20s. And she is absolutely the bright spot of her granddaddy's life. She is the most uninhibited child in terms of people. She has never seen a person she did not like. <laughs> she loves being with people. She's an outdoors girl. She doesn't like to stay inside. Anything you can do outside. That's what she wants to do. She's 12. Be 13 in, Ju in July. 
And I realize when you hit 13, everything changes. But we are so proud of our grandchildren and what they do and what they mean to us. Now the problem I have, even talking some about our grandchildren, is that we have never lived closer than eight hours to any grandchild. It's not the same as it was when I was growing up. When I was growing up, I saw my grandparents, my father's parents, just about every other day I was at their house. Saw my maternal grandparents about once a month. They lived about 29 miles away. And so we grew up knowing each other. But it's hard when the distance is there. You have to block out time. You have to block out things. You have to make sure you're communicating because you have to do it on a limited basis. Thank God for whoever invented the cell phone. Now, a lot of times I hate it, but I tell you, it does keep you in touch with those around you. It keeps us in touch with our grandchildren. Now, when you come to talk about legacy, and I've had this conversation with any number of people just in the recent past who want to talk about their legacy, what they're going to leave behind. Now let me give you the key to a legacy. You take care of your character and your legacy will take care of itself. Amen. You don't take care of your character the legacy you leave will be less than you're capable of leaving. Because character is that which you do that matches that which you say. You are not what you do. You are not what you say. You are what you do in the context of what you say. And that's terribly important. So if you have your Bible and you like to turn to Psalm 1. Psalm 1. <coughs> As the psalmist comes to write Psalm 1, I, I don't think it's in, incidental that he places this in the first position. Because if you don't get this straight, chances are the other psalms are going to tilt as well. But the psalmist says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful or the scoffer. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit, in his season, in his time. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. The way of the ungodly shall perish. I want to lift two or three things out of this to talk to you about building a legacy for your grandchildren. One, how you live. There are some things that you should not do. As a believer in Jesus Christ, I don't buy this theology that says I can get saved and do anything I want to do and never get lost again. That's not what eternal security is. Eternal security is I am saved to do everything God wants me to do. That's eternal security. I'm not at liberty to do everything even sometimes the carnal life wants me to do. There are some things I need not 
do. Number one, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Mm -hmm. Amen. You need to be careful where you walk because people are watching. You need to be careful in the light of your grandchildren because people are watching. Watching you and who you are and what you are doing, especially this is true for those of us in ministry, I, and I don't mean just the professional ministry. Those of us who are in ministry as a lawyer, like Luther Beecham, our lawyer at the Florida Baptist Convention, others who simply are in ministry, you don't have to be ordained to be in ministry. You just have to be saved, and you're in ministry. So when those of us who are in ministry walk, we must not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Be cautious. You cannot believe everything. It's like getting on a horse trying to ride in all directions. You can't do it. Make up your mind how you're going to live, how you're going to walk, what you are going to do, who you are going to associate with. Now, does that mean that I should not associate with lost people? No, it doesn't mean that. But it does mean that I don't need to walk their walk. It does mean that I don't need to listen to their counsel. It does mean that. So we walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now the ungodly, as the psalmist is characterizing them, are those who would be absolutely opposed to anything that speaks of God. We're almost there in our culture today. When we come to speak of God, I've had people in Baptist churches, you, you, this is not an apocryphal story. This is not just a story. I have had people in Baptist churches who have said to me, Oh, Allah is just another name for Jehovah. No. Uh -uh. Or the Koran is just another name for the Bible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now there's a wonderful Greek word that summarizes that. Baloney. <laughs> Amen. Allah is not another name for Jehovah. Amen. Jehovah is the only God Amen. and you can't worship other gods if you're going to worship them. That's right. That's right. We need to understand that. Our grandchildren need to understand that. One of the things that bothers me in the culture is that they pick up on that. They're in college. Their teachers believe that in this eclectic God who can be anyone you want him to be. We'd better pin it down once and for all. That's right. We're not going to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Yeah. We're going to walk in the counsel of the godly. Just be sure that those you walk with are not bringing you down, but you're bringing them up. You're bringing them up. He says, secondly, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands walking, standing. Stands, he wants us to understand. Look at it again. Nor stands in the way of sinners. Now that doesn't mean that blocks the way of sinners. It means that you're standing there and you're listening to what the sinners have to say. Notice the progression. Walking, standing, sitting. You get a little more comfortable each time in what you're doing. <coughs> he says, do not, do not walk in the counsel of of the ungodly, in the counsel of sinners, in the way of sinners. The last thing he says, do not sit in the counsel of the scoffer. The scoffer. The one who 
scoffs at the religion of Jesus Christ. One who misunderstands what John's talking about when he opens the prologue of his gospel. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, glory like unto the only begotten Son. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about our Savior. He's talking about our Lord. Now, why is this so important? I'll tell you why it's so important. There is no one else in the world that can forgive you of your sin and save you from eternal damnation other than Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we must pin that down, folks. And I can tell you there's a lot of folks in your churches that vacillate on who Jesus is, who vacillate on what he did for us. There are a lot of folks. Now if you want a good passage, I don't know whether any of you are in the Bible memory or not. If you're not, you ought to. You ought to be memorizing some scripture and hiding it in your heart. But when you turn to 1 John chapter 1, and you pick up at about verse 5, you're going to find what Jesus Christ can do for you that no one else can do. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you. That God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him mm -hmm. That's right. and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. Now here's the kicker. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And parenthetically, you don't deceive anyone else. We know. We know. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess <coughs> our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now the key to that whole passage is the word confess. That's the key to the whole passage. When I confess, God forgives when I confess, God restores. It's an interesting word. It's two Greek words put together. Homo and lego. Homo means the same as part of our vocabulary. We talk about homosexuality. That means sex between two of the same. Makes no sense to me, but that's what it means. Lego means I say. Homo lego, confess, means I say the same thing about me that God is saying about me. That's confession. That's not beating the air with pious words. That's confession for me and for you. So we ought to be able to come to grips with the fact that we're not going to sit in the seat of the scoffer. We're not going to camp there for a while to find out all that they believe. 
You share your testimony. You get real with who they are. Your grandchildren. They can see through you more quickly than you could possibly imagine. Papa's a preacher. All of them know that. Papa's a preacher. And Papa <coughs> enjoys being a preacher. But let me tell you, the very moment I miss the opportunity with them of being a preacher, I have chipped away some of my grandparenting ability and skills. I've chipped away some. So, he says, this is what you don't do. The psalmist says, number one, you do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. You do not stand in the way of sinners. And you do not sit in the seat of the scoffer. Now, let's flip that over. What do you do if you're going to build a legacy for your grandchildren? What is the part that you must do? He goes on to say, His delight is in the law of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And in His law doth He meditate day and night. This book is God's revelation to us. That's right. I, I don't want to argue about the Bible. Now there are some folks who do. They want to argue about the Bible. I'm not going to argue about the Bible. I'm going to simply say to you, once and for all, this is the Word of God Amen. that He has given to us. Yes. Now what we do with it is what the psalmist is talking about. How much do you read and meditate on the Word of God? That's going to show up somewhere in your relationship to your grandchildren. I remember a very fine deacon we had in our church. The last church I pastored, Broadmoor Baptist Church in Shreveport, Louisiana. His name was Bill Ham. Bill was one of the best men I've ever met in my life. At his funeral, I was sitting across the table of one of his sons. And his son said to me, I never got up any morning to get ready for school that my dad was not having prayer, prayer time and a quiet time. Every morning he was impressed by that. I was impressed by that. Yes. I can't say that about my children nor my grandchildren. Sometimes I think we're saved in streaks. <laughs> if we're not careful, we'll do it for a while and then we'll forget it. Mm -hmm. Listen, folks, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I simply want to know, are you meditating on the things of God out of this Word. It will catch on. It will catch on. Are you hiding some of the Word of God in your heart? Well, I don't memorize well. Well, there's a Greek word for that also. <laughs> Baloney. Main reason why we don't memorize scripture is we decide not to memorize scripture. The main reason we memorize scripture is because we make up our mind. It's the right thing to do, and we're going to do it. Now, I'm no great example of memorization of scripture. There's a lot of folks who know more than I know. But I can tell you this. Out of my recent illness and I'm not here to give you a health report but if I had not had the 46th psalm 
in my heart, yes. it would have been so much more difficult. I discovered, first time I've ever been sick. Well, somebody said you had a heart attack. Oh, they put in a stent and I went home. That's not being sick. They had hernia surgery. They put in a mesh and I went home. That's not being sick. First time I've been sick. And here's what I found. You can trust God in His Word. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore we shall not fear, though the earth be removed. Though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, there is a river. The streams whereof make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early, the heathens rage, the kingdoms were moved, mm -hmm. he uttered his voice, the earth melted. Here's the kicker. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He made the wars to cease unto the ends of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cuts the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. Amen. I will be exalted among the heathen. Amen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with Amen. us. Mm -hmm. God of Jacob is our yes. you, you had better pin some things down in your life that are non-negotiable. You'd better pin some things down in your life that you can call upon in the darkest moment of your life. You'd better pin it down. God is God and Jesus Christ is His Son. Yes. And He is my Savior yes. and my Lord. So we come to understand what are the things we are not supposed to do do not walk, stand, talk. What are we supposed to do? Plant our lives like a tree by the living water. Now that's a little hard for us to understand in the place where we live. But in the Bible lands, when you look around and there's not much water, where you plant your tree becomes critical. It's for us too to become critical. Delight in the law of the Lord. And it shall bring forth fruit in his season. Plant your life to bring forth fruit. Plant your life to bring forth fruit. If I were to ask you tonight, what is the fruit of your life? What is it about you that makes you know I've planted my life by the rivers of water? My fruit's going to come in due season. Well, one of them has to do with grandkids and kids. <clears throat> we have three children, five grandchildren. That's my fruit. And I try to say to them every time I have the opportunity, are you bearing any fruit for the Master? Are you telling anybody about Jesus for the sake of the Master? Your life has to come to the place that you produce fruit. The last thing he says, they shall prosper. They shall prosper. 
Isn't it an amazing thing that out of the same family you have so much difference and yet in the midst of all of that there is love and an understanding of prosperity. Sometimes prosperity means to most folks the accumulation of wealth. That's not so. That's not what the psalmist is talking about. Now that may take place, but that's not what the psalmist is talking about. That's like folks who tithe. I've had folks who tell me I tithe because God's going to give it back. <laughs> Let me tell you why I tithe. Because the Bible says so. Yeah, that's right. I don't need another reason. I don't need another reason. Now, tithing hasn't always been easy for me. It's always been easy for my wife. She grew up in church. I didn't. But I want you to know that when you do what's right because it's right, God will bless. God will bless. Now, this is not a sermon on tithing. I could turn it into it, but it's not me. And then prosperity, not in things. You look into the face of your baby grandchild and you come to the realization, oh my soul, how did my kids produce anything this good? <laughs> you know, you, you've had the same thought. Have you not? Yeah. People say to me, you sound like you love your grandkids more than you do your kids. No, just love them differently. Because I don't have to live with them all the time. <laughs> I told someone that at Christmas time, we used to all get together, 13 of us, for five to seven days. Now when a house goes from two to 13 for five days, at Christmas time, the most beautiful lights of Christmas are the tail lights. <laughs> you think only grandparents would understand that. But it is absolutely true. But you look into the face of these people that God has created as part of you that he's created. And just imagine, just imagine what God could do with them if we pray for them, help them, energize them. All of that. Now, let me get down to the nub of what I want to say tonight. And that's this idea of praying for them. Now, there's a number of reasons why you ought to pray. There's a number of reasons why, if you don't pray, you're going to miss the blessings of God. Whether it's with your grandchildren, for your grandchildren, or whoever you are, wherever you are. One, some principles of prayer. Prayer is the one thing in the Christian life that you have to do in order to do. No one can do it for you. Now, somebody in the church can witness for you. They can tell the story of Jesus for you. They can give all of those things. But when it comes to praying, you have to do your own praying. Does that mean you can't pray for me? I hope not. Does that mean I can't pray for you? I hope not. But I tell you what it does mean. I have to block out some time in my life when I get alone with God and right. talk to God about what's going on. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's not a monologue, it's a dialogue. And suddenly the breakthrough comes. And you understand God's doing something. And you may not be able to quantify all of it. God's doing something. And I want in on it. The fact that you can have a prayer conference like this. 
the number of people who are here. There's enough people in First Baptist Church in Newberry tonight to turn this county right side up. Amen. But you have to do it in order to do it. Second thing, the principle of prayer, is that you must come to realize that when you pray, everything may not happen the way you pray. That's right. You just need to get ready for that. I don't know why, but it does. There are no time or space limitations to pray. Now let me back up one. It's not original with me, but maybe you note takers will write it down. When you come to talk about prayer, Prayer may not change things for you, but I guarantee That's right. it will change you That's right. for things. Yes. That's the greatest principle of prayer I've ever learned. Next, there is no time or space limitation. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, some of you picked up a prayer calendar this morning and you prayed for somebody in Botswana. You prayed for a missionary whose name you can't even pronounce. Is God going to honor that prayer? Of course he is. There's no time or space limitations. I prayed for my brother for 42 years consistently for 42 years before he was saved. Mm. Now, you can say, well, you're not very much of a prayer. <laughs> oh, you don't know how far he came. You don't know the prodigal he was in, in the far country. Came to Jesus, wonderfully saved. Now, I'd like to tell you that it was all on my prayers. My mother died at 36 years of age. In 1953, I heard my mother pray for me more than one time. I wasn't saved until August of 1955. He wasn't saved until he was 64 years old. Now try to convince me that my mother's prayer didn't have something to do with the salvation of her two sons. You couldn't convince me. I know that our prayers had something to do with my salvation. I know it. I know it. So, there has to be this idea of the prayer life. Well, let me give you one more. It's the only thing that brings God into everything. Prayer is the only thing that brings God into everything that we do. I wouldn't dream of getting up to preach without praying. That's right. Just wouldn't do it. Just wouldn't do it. I wouldn't dream of sharing my story about Jesus without praying over the story. So it brings God into everything we do. We need to understand that. Well, let's look at some practical things that crop out of these principles and out of this prayer life that we're going to have on the part of our grandchildren. Now, I want to try to capsule it in four words. The first word, as you pray, pray for consistency in your life and in their life. Pray for <coughs> consistency. I am really convinced more than ever before in my ministry. Everybody's trying to analyze why church attendance is down, why baptisms are down, why Sunday school is down. 
I don't know all of the factors, but I can tell you this. The lack of consistency on the part of leadership in Baptist churches is one reason. One reason. The consistency that you and I must have before our grandchildren. We need to be who we are. I never did want to be buddies with my children nor my grandchildren. I wanted to be a dad to my children. I wanted to be a dad to my grandchildren, not, not a buddy, not a friend. I wanted to assume the role of father and grandfather and be consistent in that. Let them see the example of my life. And I pray for their consistency. I'd like to tell you that all of my kids and grandkids are involved in the church up to their eyeballs. The truth of the matter is, they're not. And I preach them sermons about it every time I'm with them. Because consistency out in the marketplace matters. Your example. Secondly, your commitment. What is your commitment? Now, you're never going to mean much to the kingdom of God without commitment. Now, I don't know all there is to know about commitment or even how to define everything there is to know about commitment. My, my best observation is marriage. <clears throat> Do you remember when you stood in front of the preacher? whether it was in a church or whether it was some other place. And you listen carefully to what he had to say. I remember it well at 18 years of age. Do you, John Sullivan, take this woman, Nancy Henson, to be your lawfully wedded wife in sickness or in health, in poverty or in wealth, and whatever the circumstances of life might dictate, you will be a true and faithful husband. And I said, 50% of the time. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. Neither did you. If I had said that, I wouldn't have been able to walk out of the church. <laughs> no, I said, I do. I do commit my life to her. I do commit my life to family. Commitment. What's the level of your commitment in prayer life? What's the level of your commitment in church life? In church life. Haphazard. Here today, gone tomorrow. Can you be dependent on in your commitment to the life of your church? What is your commitment to church? Your commitment to the Bible. I've already mentioned that. I simply mentioned it again. You ought to read the Bible and you ought to memorize some Bible. Commitment. Like I say, I don't know all there is to know about it. But I know this much. My commitment is to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There comes a time in my life, there came a time in my life, and it might not have come in your life yet, but it will, where you no longer look for the green pastures and the still waters. You look for Jesus. That's right. And wherever he takes you is going to be okay. You look for Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. You look for him. And when you're following Jesus, you can't be going in the wrong direction. That's right. When you're following Jesus, you're always going in the right direction. Every single time. So look for Him and follow Him. Listen to Him and what He has to say. 
sometimes we get so involved in looking for the pot of gold that we miss the beauty of the rainbow. Sometimes we look out our window and say it's a dreary day today only to discover it's sunshine outside. Our windows are dirty. <laughs> Has nothing to do with the sunshine. We need to have a commitment that will stand. Commitment to stewardship. I really believe in commitment to stewardship. Yes. I told you earlier, I was 18 years old when Nancy led me to faith in Christ. I had never owned a Bible. I had never read from a Bible that I remember, probably did, but I don't remember it. You see, when I was 16 years old, I knew more than anybody else in the world. <laughs> now, I know that did not happen to any of the rest of you, but I was absolutely sold on myself. I didn't need anyone, didn't need anything. And so when I come to talk about stewardship, and we were getting ready to go to church the first morning after I was saved, and I put this in context. Nancy grew up in act teens and GAs and sunbeams, choir. She grew up in all of that. She could speak the language of Zion. I didn't know what she was talking about. But the first Sunday we went to church after I was saved, as we were getting ready to go to church, she said, we're going to start tithing today. I said, what what does, what does that mean? She said, we're going to give 10% of everything we earn through the church. And I asked her that typical Baptist question, gross or net? <laughs> she said, gross on all of it. I said, why would we want to do that? <clears throat> and the only thing she said was, because the Bible tells us so. Now, if it sounds like I'm bragging, remember the words of Dizzy Dean when Dizzy pitched his last game was the winningest pitcher at the time. And they said, Mr. Dean, it sounds like you're bragging. And Dizzy said, if you've done it, it ain't bragging. <laughs> For 59 years, we have never missed a tithe check Amen. to our church. Amen. 59 years. And as God blessed us, we have essentially been double tithing. We send our tithe to the church and we support missions with part of it. We don't take our tithe from the church to support missions anywhere in the world. Even as much as I love Haiti, I don't take my tithe and give it to Haiti. Oh no. In addition to the tithe, Amen. that's what you ought to do. Yeah, lucky as that. God blesses. Is Trina here? She's not here. Wonderful story. One of the ladies got under the burden of building a house in Haiti. And she's done it. We've finished the house. She's done it. As a result of that, there comes into her life a new measure of stewardship. When she got the house paid for, she said, now, what do I need to do next? <laughs> and 
she made some suggestions. And I said, I wish you'd continue to support Haiti. I got a check today. Support for Haiti. Stewardship and what it means. So stewardship. You ought to also have a commitment to what God has gifted you to do. You don't need to worry about my gifts. You need to be concerned about your gifts. And your grandchildren will pick up on that. I guarantee you they will pick up on it. Your giftedness and their giftedness. It is such an amazing thing to watch how their mind works. Such an amazing thing to watch them as they start developing personality and they start discovering who they are. Now, it takes some longer to discover than others. I've known some 75-year-olds that haven't discovered yet <laughs> that God gifted them to do something and to be someone. God never saves you for nothing. He saves you to something. And that giftedness comes into play. I have a commitment to God's giftedness that I want my grandchildren to see. Without apology, without apology, I want them to see. Without apology, I want them to know that Papa's a preacher. Yeah. And I told them, when I croak, and you walk out to the cemetery and you take that little marble stone thing and set it up. I wanted to say one thing. He was a Baptist preacher. <laughs> he was a Baptist preacher. A commitment to the calling. Yes. A commitment to those qualities. I have a commitment to marriage. I've already alluded to that. I'll not go back over it. Have a commitment. And then the last part of what I want to say is that you have to find ways to communicate to your grandchildren what you're praying about for them. Now my five are as different as daylight and dark. None of them have the same personalities. My Ashley, as I mentioned, is so sensitive, so caring. Our Chelsea wants to be a surgeon. I said, well, why not psychiatry? She said, you can't help them. <laughs> She said, but you can take out a knee and put in a knee and tell them to go home. You can help them. You can help them. She loves fixing things. Our Alex, she's always is wanting to be a mama. Yeah. She's so, I said, what are, you, what are you going to do? She said, I'm going to be a mom. Amen. Now, I may have to work. But I'll only work if I have to. <clears throat> I want to raise my children. Different personality altogether. Different personality altogether. Our grandson's rather timid. He's rather timid. And then our baby girl. It's so wide open. So wide open. So you've got to find a way to communicate with every one of them. One style will not get it done. One size will not fit all when it comes to this legacy and this character and this prayer life that you have on behalf of your grandchildren. So we have to find a way to communicate. 
Now, communication is always difficult. And sometimes it's more difficult within the context of the family than it is without the context of the family. Sometimes the hardest people in the world to talk to about Jesus are family members. They don't want to hear it. Or they've heard it all before. And so you have to find a way to communicate to your grandchildren. And to let them know you are praying that God will bless their life beyond all measure. That Papa believes in you. There's one thing I want my grandkids to know is that I'll take the shot for them. I believe in them and who they are. Now my grandkids are not as perfect as your grandkids. I understand that also. But I want you to know that I want them to know that I believe in them. And as a result of believing in them, I'll let them know that I'm praying as well for all that God's going to allow them to do. So the communication aspect of the life of grandparents. Now I have to admit, Nancy's probably a better grandmother than I am a grandfather. Because my tendency is get it done. Her tendency is patience. In fact, her patience drives me to destruction <laughs> at times. She is so patient with the grandchildren. I may be up in, on the stump ranting and raving. And she said, you used to act like that. <laughs> don't, don't you remember when you acted like that? And I have to admit that I do. But every grandparent ought to find a way communicate to their grandchildren all of the truth of God's word. One other passage I want to leave with you that I think speaks to this in particular. My favorite book of the Bible is the book of Philippians. I love the letter of Paul to Philippi. Now you know the setting. He was at Troas and had the Macedonian vision and Philippi was the chief city of Macedonia. So Paul went to Macedonia, went to Philippi. There's no synagogue that's ever been found in Philippi. There was not a large Jewish consistence, a, a, a large Jewish population so there is no synagogue. And he went down by the river and he found some ladies. The leader of those was Lydia, seller of purple, probably from Thyatira. Apparently a very prosperous businesswoman, which in itself is an amazing thing. A businesswoman in that day and time a lot different in this day and time. And the thing that amazed me about Lydia is not that they were down there searching for God and Paul found them searching for God and helped them to understand who God is. But the thing that has always amazed me is that Lydia made up her mind, I'm going to be a part of this. There is no way she was not going to be a part of their ministry. No, you're coming home with me. There's no way. You are never marginalized in your ministry. You are vital to everything God is doing. There's not a pastor in here that would not say amen to the fact, I love it 
when I find someone insisting on being part of the ministry of the church. I, I want to do that. I can do that. Most of the time, you have to drag them to get it done. Here it is. Chapter 1, verse 1. The book of Philippians. I think it's apropos for our grandchildren. Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always, in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Here's the kicker. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. What an amazing, what an amazing promise. What an amazing promise. God has begun a good work in the life of our grandchildren. And you and I need to be part of that. Praying for them consistently, communicating with them regularly. All of that is vital for grandparents to be a part of the heritage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Brother Hudson, I'm out of steam. <laughs> but I tell you what I will do. I'll take about five minutes or so before the others come traipsing through and see if you have any questions that you might want to ask me. They don't have to be questions about grandparenting. They don't have to be questions about anything. Just something you've always wanted to ask. And now's your opportunity. <laughs> Anyone at all have a question? Anyone? Well, I must have really done well. If yeah. you have a question. <laughs> It takes $2,700, $2,500 a week need to scale it back. At this time, it was cheaper at one time because we were building them fast. We had the money. It takes uh, $2,500. And we can build a house that will house a family of four. Now, for us, that means three bedrooms. <laughs> yeah. By Asian standards, that means it's about 20 by 20. And it would be the nicest house in the neighborhood since the earthquake. And you have helped us build these houses. Florida Baptists have done well in building houses in the because we realize that you'll love this. I hope you'll love it. When the earthquake came to Haiti, we had been there about 14 years already, building churches, training pastors, all of that. You see, the International Mission Board has no missionaries in Haiti. Florida Baptist pay six missionaries in Haiti. All Haitians has been one of the secrets of our success. And we have about 1,700 churches that we have started in 16 years. Amen. But the beautiful thing about it is that we were there 
less than two days after the earthquake. No one else was getting in. They took us in on a cargo plane so that we could get our boots on the ground. I'll never forget one of the pastors saying, we knew you would come. We knew you would come. It's a wonderful place to minister. Uh, David Burton just got back from there. I think something like 3,000 people saved in street crusades. It's a wonderful place to minister. But if you want to build a house in Haiti, let me know. I can find a way to take you. <laughs> yes, sir. Tell the people who your wife looks like in the movie star. <laughs> she looked like Rue McClanahan of the Golden Girls. <laughs> Blanche. <laughs> and when somebody says that to her, I say, and she acts like Blanche. <laughs> and then I decide not to go home that evening. <laughs> yes, sir. I don't have a question, but thank you very, very much for a beautiful message. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.
we have spent more nights in motels than we have in our house. <laughs> Somebody asked, how long have you lived at your house? I said, probably 10 years. <laughs> well, man, you've been here 25 years. You've been in the same house. You said, how long have we lived in our house? <laughs> it has been one of the best things that God has ever allowed me to do. And folks like you, down the earth, salt of the earth, kind of folks, makes all the headaches worthwhile. God bless you.